All right, so first of all, we'd like to thank Professor Cameron, Dr. Nemitz, and the Vancouver Institute for inviting us here this evening. Um, we are honored to present the uh, Irving K. Barber Learning Center lecture here tonight. Um, our plan is to talk for about 45 or 50 minutes and then to open it up for questions and comments. We'd really like to hear from all of you. As physicians, Jerry and I spend a lot of time trying to stay up to date with the latest medical advances, new technologies, new medications, but also to sort through the clinical controversies that have arisen where the experts disagree about testing and treatment. Today, we hope to convince you that when you understand why the experts disagree, you'll be able to make better medical decisions. In recent years, there's been a shift. It's not just medical professionals who are struggling with these kinds of issues. Everyone is now directly confronted with medical information and advice through the media. You can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine, turn on the television or the radio, and certainly you can't surf the internet without encountering medical information and controversy. And because of this, patients are increasingly aware of the fact that experts disagree. So we'd like to show you some examples of that in the next couple of slides. This is our disclosure statement, and I'm just gonna skip by that. Okay, so this is actually a photograph of the Wall Street, a page in the Wall Street Journal from about a year ago. And I took it with my brand new iPhone at the time. And it addresses the question of whether or not healthy people should take cholesterol-lowering drugs, statins, to treat their high cholesterol and prevent heart disease. And you can see it's a point counterpoint. On one side, yes, they save lives. On the other side, no high cost, little gain. Another controversy that's been in the news recently concerns vitamin D. Should everybody take vitamin D? And if so, how much? What's the normal level of vitamin D? And should we even be measuring levels of vitamin D? So this slide is from um, a little over a year ago, November 2011. And it shows the headlines from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal on the same day, shortly after a report came out from the Institute of Medicine in the United States based in Washington with their recommendations regarding vitamin D. And you can see the interpretation of the New York Times after looking at this was extra vitamin D is not necessary. On the other hand, the Wall Street Journal recommended that you triple your dose. I'm sure you're all aware of the recent controversies concerning cancer screening. At what age and how often should a woman have a mammogram? And this is from a New York Times piece, again, um, just a little over a year ago, questioning the role of the mammogram. And you can see at the bottom it says, has the power of the mammogram been oversold? Finally, the debate about screening for prostate cancer, which has been just everywhere. And you can see um, at the top of the cartoon is from the family guy. I don't know if they have that here. Um, so about a year ago, um, the PBS NewsHour did a, a one-hour segment on the whole question of PSA screening and pro treatment of prostate cancer. And then exactly a year later, the Wall Street Journal came out with a point-counterpoint questioning whether men should get PSA tests to screen for prostate cancer or not. So every one of these issues, and many others, remain an area of active controversy, both in medical journals and in the lay press. So with this flood of information, the public is acutely aware that experts disagree. So how does a patient make the right choice when faced with these kinds of controversies and disagreement among experts? We didn't have a ready answer, so we began to search. So first we went back to the textbooks, <clears throat> and we looked at classic medical decision analysis, which is drawn from economics. And a formula is used to calculate what is the best decision. And this formula is derived from Daniel Bernoulli, 
who was a mathematician, among other things, in Holland in the 1700s. And Bernoulli was looking at decision making in the marketplace. Holland at the time was the center of trade. And he said that the best choice is calculated by looking at the probability of a certain outcome and multiplying it by the utility or the impact that that outcome has. Now in economics, the probability of an outcome might mean selling a certain number of products. And the utility is basically the impact on the bottom line, how the profit impacts the company. Now this formula was imported from economics into medicine. And when applied to medicine, you can estimate the probability of an outcome. For example, in treating early stage prostate cancer, you can look at the probability of an outcome if you choose surgery or radiation, which can mean either incontinence or impotence. But then the question becomes, how do you put a number on the second part of the equation, on the utility, the impact it has on your life? Now, there are three different methods that have been used in classic medical decision analysis. The first is a linear rating scale from zero to one. Zero is death, one is perfect health. And you're supposed to look at the scale, say if you're a man thinking about treatment for prostate cancer, and say, well, if I became incontinent or if I became impotent, my life would be at this point between zero and one. Another method is called the time trade-off. Here you're asked, how many years of life would you trade off in order to avoid becoming incontinent or impotent? And the third is what's called the standard gamble, which comes from game theory. And you're asked to imagine that there's a magic pill. And this magic pill can completely prevent a certain outcome. It can completely prevent either incontinence or impotence. But in a certain percentage of cases, it kills you immediately. <laughs> and you're supposed to estimate what odds you would be willing to take to completely avoid a certain outcome versus the chance you might be killed right off the bat. Now, Recent research in cognitive psychology has shown that these three methods are all severely flawed. It sounds like common sense. The problem is you cannot reliably forecast your life in the future. You can't accurately understand the impact that a certain outcome will have on your life if you've never experienced it. Also, Medical conditions are not static. They're dynamic. They're changing over time. And not only does the condition change, but people adapt. So the impact on your life changes over time as well. Despite this, these three methods are very well established and broadly used in terms of deciding what is best. They are used to calculate what are called qualities, quality-adjusted life years. They are the basis for making medical decisions through the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. And there, they ask 3,000 healthy British citizens, how much time would you trade off in order not to become incontinent or impotent? And in the United States, they're used by policy analysts and insurance companies and were recently proposed to be the foundation for decision making as part of healthcare reform in the United States. Now, what happens when you actually talk to people who have the medical condition or problem? Self-reported quality of life from patients is very different from what we may imagine as their quality of life. So, for example, in Britain, healthy people say that being blind 
is 0.5 on a scale of 0 to 1. That is, if you're blind, it reduces the utility of your life by 50%. Now, I happen to have a first cousin who's blind. She's been blind since birth. She was a premature infant and in the 1940s was exposed to high oxygen, which destroyed her vision. She's currently retired. She is on the board of her synagogue. She volunteers in an assisted living facility, helping sight-impaired elderly people, teaching them how to use Braille so that they can get on the Internet. If you told my first cousin that her life was a 0 0.5 on a scale of 0 to 1, she would hit you in the face. <laughs> Similarly, men with prostate cancer who are followed by what's called active surveillance or watchful waiting with no intervention, and men who have surgery where there's a very high rate of incontinence and impotence, both groups report the quality of life at the same level. So in fact, when you speak to people who actually have a certain medical condition, their assessment of their own life is very, very different than what people who are healthy or have never experienced that medical condition believe. So this entire structure of medical decision-making is deeply flawed. And Daniel Kahneman, who I know is at the University of British Columbia after he came from Israel, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, a cognitive psychologist, recently gave an address to an international meeting of medical decision analysts. And he said this paradigm of measuring utility is like measuring the ether in 19th century physics when the ether did not exist. So we realized the textbooks were not giving us the answers that we were looking for. And then we thought about Sir William Osler, one of the most famous physicians of all times who practiced in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And he made the following comment about making a difficult medical diagnosis. He said, listen to the patient. Because if you know how to listen, he's telling you the answer. So we decided to listen to patients. We interviewed scores of patients in great depth, patients of different ages, different parts of the country, different socioeconomic groups, and different kinds of medical problems. And we asked them how they made their medical decisions. And although we found that people were individual about how they made their decisions, there were common threads. So in order to demonstrate these common threads to you, we'd like to involve all of you in a thought experiment right now. And we'd like to begin by asking you a few questions. So first of all, raise your hand if you yourself have been a patient over the past year. And when I say a patient, not only have you been in the hospital or in the emergency room, but have you had a checkup or an appointment for just a minor issue? Pretty much everyone. So now try to remember the experience of being a patient. Put yourself in the mindset of being a patient. And now imagine that you're sitting in your doctor's office and your doctor tells you that your blood pressure is too high. And though, even though you've been exercising, you've changed your diet, you've lost weight, your blood pressure has remained too high, and now it's time for medication. So raise your hand if you want to be proactive, if you want to aim for perfect blood pressure control, and you'll do whatever it takes to get it. Okay. Now raise your hand. If you feel that your blood pressure doesn't need to be absolutely perfect, you just want the minimum amount of medication. Ooh. <laughs> so the first group, we apply the term maximalist. You want to be ahead of the curve, do everything and more. And the second group, the minimalists, less is more. Now your doctor prescribes the blood pressure medication. It turns out it comes in two forms. 
One is extracted from an herb, from a natural source. The other is made in a laboratory using the latest technology. Both are chemically identical, and because we're in Canada, the cost is not a question. <laughs> your doctor offers you a choice. Raise your hand if you would prefer to take a medication that comes from a natural source. Okay? Now raise your hand if you would prefer a medication synthesized in a laboratory using technology. Okay, it's a pretty even split. Um, the first group has what's called a naturalism orientation. These are people who prefer to have treatments that come from natural sources, and particularly for problems that might be amenable like pain, they might seek out acupuncture or massage, they look for supplements, dietary supplements, and so on. In the United States, south of here, that represents about 60% of the population based on surveys. The other group has what's called a technology orientation. They look for generally high-tech solutions, breakthroughs from the laboratory, often cutting-edge treatments. So your doctor gives you a prescription for the medication that you picked and you fill the prescription and now you're sitting down and you're about to take your first pill. So raise your hand if you swallow it down, confident that you're on the right path to solving your problem of high blood pressure. Okay. Now raise your hand if you take the pill out of the bottle, stare at it for a while, <laughs> take the package insert out, read it a few more times with regard to all the side effects and wonder if you should really take it. <laughs> so the first group, we term that the believers. Believers are certain that there's a good solution for their problem, whether it be a natural or a high technology solution, and once they find it, they're ready to go for that. And the doubters, that's the second group, worry that the treatment is going to be worse than the disease. So the terms for these mindsets are what came out of the many interviews that we did with patients. These were the common threads that we found that characterized their approach to their maintaining health and addressing medical problems when they occurred. And these mindsets applied not only to problems like high blood pressure or high cholesterol, but also to decisions around surgery and treatment of cancer. So one of the first uh, people we spoke with is a woman we call Susan Powell. All the people we talk about tonight are real, but we change their names for confidentiality. Now, Susan is in her 40s. She works um, regularly and on a routine checkup with her uh, primary care physician, was found to have an elevated cholesterol level of 240, and this was rechecked, and the normal cutoff uh, is 200. Now, Susan's a very active person. She walks regularly, follows a healthy diet, does not smoke, does not have high blood pressure or diabetes. And her doctor said, Susan, you need treatment for your elevated cholesterol. You need a statin medication. This will decrease your risk of a heart attack by 30%. Now, that made an impression on Susan. She said she'd think about it but she did not immediately fill the prescription. And over the course of several months, she sought more information about elevated cholesterol and its treatment. And while surfing the internet, she came upon a government website from the National Institutes of Health that has what's called a risk calculator, and this exists in Canada as well. Here, you put in your individual characteristics, that is, her cholesterol level, her age, her gender, the fact she doesn't smoke, doesn't have hypertension or diabetes. And the risk calculator answers a key question that every patient should ask himself or herself regardless of the medical condition 
And that is, what is my risk of a certain outcome without any treatment? Now, in Susan's case, a woman in her 40s with a cholesterol of 240 and no other risk factors for heart disease, the chance that she would have a heart attack over the next 10 years is 1 in 100, 1%. Even if she were in her 50s and her cholesterol rose to 280, her risk of a heart attack over the next 10 years would be 2 in 100, 2%. So you see how your mind plays a trick on you. When you hear that a statin medication will reduce your risk of a heart attack by 30%, it sounds to you as if you are at 100% risk for the heart attack. But in Susan's case, it's actually 30% of 1%, or if she were in her 50s with a cholesterol of 280, it would be 30% of 2%, which clearly has a much different impact in terms of thinking than what she had originally heard. Now, some of the people we spoke with, like a woman we call Michelle Bird, who is a maximalist and a believer, and Michelle said to us, I would absolutely take that statin medication, I could be that one in a hundred who would have the heart attack in the next 10 years. Give me the pill. But Susan was a minimalist and a doubter and was not convinced by the numbers. But there was more to Susan's story than just numbers. Shortly after she was given the statin prescription, she went to a dinner at her church. And there she met an acquaintance who was hobbling around looking very uncomfortable and ill. And she went up and spoke to her. And it turned out that this woman had been prescribed the very same medication that Susan had been prescribed. And she had had a side effect from the medication, the most common side effect of this type of medication, which is muscle inflammation or myopathy. So as you know, stories like this have powerful effects on all of us. Cognitive scientists call the effect of stories availability because the powerful story stays in your mind and is readily available. And these kinds of stories lead all of us to overestimate the likelihood or probability that we would have the same kind of event happen to us. So although stories can be useful, they can also be misleading, making something rare appear common. So when you hear a story like this, you need to know the numbers. How common is this side effect of myopathy or muscle inflammation while taking a statin? Well, it turns out that the number ranges from as low as 1% to as high as about 10%, depending on the type of statin, the dose, other medications that you might be taking, and other medical problems that you might have. So 10%, that might sound like a pretty high number. But now let's present or frame the information the opposite way. Between 90 and 99% of patients do not have this side effect of muscle inflammation. And this sounds much better, but the information is just the same. So when you are trying to make a decision of this type, it's important to flip the frame present the information, listen to the information in both the positive and the negative. Now you might think framing is primarily a problem for patients, but a number of studies, including one very recent study from Switzerland, show that doctors are just as susceptible to framing as patients are. So how do patients get numbers and other information about medical treatments? Well, one way is through drug advertisements. And if you watch the evening news and a couple hours of primetime television, at least in the United States, you will see in excess of 1,000 drug advertisements per year, which works out to about 16 hours, which is a lot more time than most people spend with their doctors. And these ads are effective. For every $1,000 that's spent, 24 new prescriptions are written. 
So drug ads are carefully constructed to use both the power of numbers and the power of stories to sell their product. So let's look at how it's done. Numbers are framed in the most positive way. And for example, for a statin medication, it might say that it would reduce your risk of a heart attack by 30%, but it doesn't say that it's 30% of 1% or 30% of 2%. So in the next slide, I'd like to show you um, an advertisement for a medication that was recently approved to treat patients with atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal heart rhythm. And the medication is Dibigatron, that's the generic name, and it's sold under the trade name of Pradaxa. And this particular advertisement is an ad on an internet site, and it's meant for patients. And the ad uses numbers very effectively. So you can see that it shows the doctor, the cardiologist in his white coat with the stethoscope, who's presenting the information to you, the patient. And he gets your, your attention immediately by stating that if you have atrial fibrillation, you are five times more likely to have a stroke. Now, five times, very threatening. That sounds like you definitely need treatment. But what are the real numbers? In other words, what's the baseline risk for a stroke if you have atrial fibrillation and you're not treated? So the doctors in the audience here know that this depends on what's called a CHAD score, whether or not you have heart failure, high blood pressure, diabetes, your age, and whether or not you've had a stroke or a TIA in the past. And this number varies for ambulatory patients between 0.5% per year, so half of a percent, at the lowest CHAD score, up to about 6% at the highest CHAD score. So these are much less impressive sounding numbers than a five times increased risk. So now let's frame those numbers in the opposite way. The vast majority of patients with atrial fibrillation, between 94 and 99.5 percent, will not have a stroke each year despite having untreated atrial fibrillation. Now the ad goes on to say that the risk for a stroke associated with atrial fibrillation is decreased by 35 percent more with the new drug than with the old drug which is warfarin, that's the traditional uh, medication that's used. But what are the actual numbers? So it turns out in the clinical trial that was done for purposes of approving this drug, the risk of stroke was 1.7% per year with the standard treatment and 1.1% with the new treatment. So this is a difference of 0.6%. So although the relative decrease in risk was 35%, the actual decrease in risk was 0.6%, six-tenths of a percent. And I think you'll all agree that if I reconfigured this advertisement to tell you that the new drug was 0.6% better than the old drug, you'd be a lot less impressed. The information is the same, just presented in a different way. So you need to be very careful when relative rather than absolute numbers are given. It turns out that when patients hear numbers the way they're presented in drug advertisements, a study from Dartmouth showed that they typically think the medication is 10 times more effective than it really is. And this is not just a problem for patients. Doctors, too, when looking at the results of clinical trials, if you're just looking quickly at the abstract, it will say that the new drug was 35% more effective than the old. So a problem for all of us. Now, we've talked about numbers. How about stories? Now, I don't know if you've seen these Pradaxa ads here in, in Canada, but in the United States, they were everywhere. And one of the ones that Jerry and I saw quite frequently showed a grandfather who was going off to fish with his uh, son and grandson on a beautiful summer day with the sun sparkling on the water. And the clear message is that the grandfather had made it to this day in good health by taking this particular medication. Now the advertisers know that the story is powerful, 
So they keep it going, and now the rest of the family comes, and everybody is hugging and kissing, and it's a really heartwarming scene. And at that point, you have the soft voiceover with the side effects. <laughs> Severe bleeding, death. And they don't mention, although they tell you to contact your doctor if you have bleeding, they don't mention that there is no way to reverse the anticoagulation with this medication, nor do they mention that there seems to be an increased risk of heart attack with this new medication. Now, experts are also a major source of information for patients. And uh, here you have a, a governmental insurance in the United States, we, of course, have a mix of some government and a lot of private. And the insurance companies have been advertising, saying that they have the experts. And this is an advertisement from United Healthcare, which is the largest private insurer in the United States. And it shows a woman who's a very vigorous jogger, and the story is she has a knee problem, and the insurance company says that it has the numbers. It has big data. And this data involves report cards on doctors. So the insurance company will tell you which surgeon to see. The insurance company says it knows the right procedure for you. And then it says you know you will have the right outcome. Now, this is impossible to promise anyone that with any particular treatment, whether it be a surgery, a medication, or whatever, that you will have the right outcome, meaning an absolute benefit with no complication or risk of side effects. Now, patients also receive guidance from so-called expert committees. And as Pam said at the beginning of the talk, Patients have become acutely aware that there are these different expert opinions. For example, cancer screening. Around three years ago, there was a huge controversy in the United States over mammograms. And a recent review in the New England Journal written by a Canadian specialist, Ellen Warner at the University of Toronto, looked at the different recommendations from expert committees and the data on mammograms, and four different expert committees came up with four different recommendations with respect to when a woman should begin to have mammograms, what age, and how often. The controversy over prostate cancer screening for PSA. There were two studies published in the New England Journal. One was conducted in the United States and there was a group that had PSA screening and then a so-called control group. Now, you would imagine the control group would not have PSA screening, but it turned out that more than half the men in the control group actually went and got PSA screening through their doctors. <laughs> now, this study did not show a benefit, but a very large study in Europe did show a benefit in terms of saving lives. But that study had its own flaws, because there was not a uniform agreement from country to country, it was conducted throughout Europe, about what cutoff should be used to biopsy, what PSA, how often it should be done, and so on. Now, three different expert committees. In the United States, a government panel, the Preventive Services Task Force, the American Cancer Society, and the Urological Association. Each one came up with a different opinion based on these studies, ranging from no screening whatsoever for healthy men from the government panel to an individual decision made between the doctor and the patient from the American Cancer Society to recommending screening with decision-making shared by the Urological Association. Three different committees, three different opinions. So now I'd like to get a little personal and talk about our own medical mindsets. And Jerry, you go first. 
Okay, so I was raised in a family with a, a strong Eastern European Jewish tradition where doctors were on a pedestal. Physicians like Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin were heroes for their work with polio and honored in my family the same way Winston Churchill was in defeating the Nazis. And science and technology were also greatly honored. So anything that was thought to be, quote, natural was seen as a throwback to village life in Hungary. So I was clearly raised as a believer with a technology orientation. And being a believer meant doing everything to the maximum. The attitude in my family was that every medication, every pill must mean better health. Now my father in his early 50s had a massive heart attack and died. We lived in a working class uh, neighborhood in Queens and he did not get intensive cutting edge treatment. There was no intensive care unit in the community hospital and so on. Possibly he could have survived if he had been treated intensively, possibly not. But that experience reinforced my belief in intensive treatments and the maximalist mindset. And this extended not only to heart disease, but to all of medicine. And in part, my choice to become a blood specialist and cancer specialist in the 1970s came about with bone marrow transplantation where people with leukemia and lymphoma who otherwise would have died going through the most intensive treatment, some of them could be saved. So my medical mind is that of a believer, a maximalist with a technology orientation. And I had a different kind of upbringing. I was the first child in my family, and when I was a baby, the doctor explained to my parents that the experts had developed a new scientific way to feed the baby, and that was to feed every four hours by the clock. Now my dad, who was an engineer, was very enthusiastic about applying scientific principles to child rearing, so he made a chart for my mother, and so that she could keep track of this every four hours around the clock, and then he went to work. <laughs> and my mother was left with a very unhappy baby who was screaming at me, and um, it didn't take too long before she took matters into her own hands and fed me when she thought I was hungry. And when my dad came home, he asked her, how can you not follow the advice of the, the doctors, the experts? And her response was, well, experts don't know everything. So my parents were ahead of their time with respect to a healthy lifestyle. They never smoked, they were avid exercisers. My dad got my sisters and I up early every morning to do the Royal Canadian Air Force exercises. <laughs> And my mother had us eating whole wheat bread, which in the 1950s was not a particularly tasty thing. And my parents have had the good fortune, either by virtue of their genetic background and the way they were uh, raised, um, to live long and healthy lives with a minimum of medical intervention. They're now in their late 80s. My dad's 89 this year. He still uh, goes to the gym every day. He, then he goes on his computer and does his work. My mom is an avid golfer. And this kind of background has contributed to my minimalist doubter orientation. So Jerry's a maximalist and a believer, and I'm a minimalist and a doubter. And we maintain these mindsets about our own personal health despite going to very similar medical schools. Jerry went to Columbia, I went to Harvard, and we trained at the very same hospital in Boston, Mass General Hospital, for our residency training. So why are we telling you this? We're pointing it out to show you that doctors and experts have medical minds too, and this can impact the advice that they give you. So how might this play out in the clinical setting? Well, it turns out that there are many, many areas of medicine 
that fall into what we call a gray, a gray area or a gray zone, where there are multiple options and not just one answer that's right for every individual. So I'm going to give you an example from my own practice as an endocrinologist. So I frequently see people with thyroid nodules. That's lumps in the thyroid. And most of these nodules are benign, but a small number turn out to be malignant. To evaluate these nodules, we do a needle biopsy. And sometimes these biopsies don't give us a definite result. In fact, sometimes even after multiple biopsies, we don't get enough cells and we can't make a definite diagnosis. Then we need to decide if surgery is needed. So recently I saw a patient who was in this situation. She had a thyroid nodule that was picked up on a routine physical. She had an ultrasound examination that showed no particularly worrisome features. And the risk of malignancy in this setting is estimated to be between 2 and 12 percent. She had three biopsies at three different hospitals, couldn't get enough cells. So she said to me, what would you do? Now, what would you do? That's a question that doctors get asked all the time. What would you do for yourself, for your family, for your children, for your mother? So I said, if it were me, I'd watch and wait. But if it were my husband, Jerry, he would have had surgery yesterday. <laughs> now, we're not suggesting that the doctor and the patient need to have the same medical mindset. Sometimes being challenged can help you make a better decision. But doctors need to understand and respect the patient's mindset, and patients need to be aware that the doctor has a mindset too. So now let's return to the subject of why experts disagree. With respect to the subject of PSA screening, we believe that they disagree because they have these different mindsets. So with respect to PSA screening, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, they represent the minimalist doubter point of view. Less is more. They don't recommend any screening for any healthy men. And this has become an increasingly popular perspective because of the rising cost of health care and problems in the economy. The American Urologic Association they represent the maximalist believer point of view. Everyone should be screened. And the American Cancer Society falls in the middle. Now, none of these recommendations is strictly objective. All three societies are looking at the very same data, and yet they come up with different recommendations based on different mindsets. Now, some of the most difficult decisions are made regarding end-of-life care. And many people believe that so-called advanced directives or living wills will take care of everything. But it, studies show that 50% or more of people change their minds. And they choose differently when they're sick compared to what they wrote in their advanced directive or living will when they were healthy. And this, again, is because you cannot forecast how you will think, how you will weigh risk and benefit in the future under circumstances that you've not yet experienced. Furthermore, advanced directives cannot encompass every possible scenario. For example, a person may say, I am not going on a ventilator, on a respirator. I'm not having a tube put down. I'm not going on that machine. The person becomes ill and then develops pneumonia and would need to be on the ventilator for, say, three or four days in order for antibiotics to take hold and the pneumonia to be controlled. Should that person not go on the ventilator for three or four days because it was in the advanced directive? Now, the other issue that's faced is what is futile? What is worthless in terms of treating very sick people? And there were attempts made throughout the world, in Europe, Canada, the United States, to develop formulas to say, if people have this characteristic, this characteristic, this characteristic with a certain disease, 
There's no reason to do anything. Now, it turns out that those formulas do not work. They work on a population basis. If you look at 100,000 people with heart failure, they'll be accurate. But they can't tell you which one, which individual in the intensive care unit with the heart failure will be the one who will survive. They can't estimate it. They'll just say 5% survive or 10% survive and 90% or 95% won't. And many of the people who do survive go on and live a good quality of life. <clears throat> the other complexity has to do with so-called surrogates. Sometimes people are in a coma, where they're on so much medication they can't think clearly. And then a family member, a loved one, a spouse, a child, a partner, is asked to decide for that person. And there's no easy answer to this, but we believe it can be helpful to go back and think about the mindsets, believer, doubter, maximalist, minimalist, technology, naturalism, of that individual who can't decide for himself or herself, and at least approximate how that individual might think about the current situation given the general way they approach their health. Now, how, let's go to people like us who can think and are able to make choices. How do we make a decision when the experts disagree? We think it's essential to examine three dimensions. First, the person's medical mind or mindset. Believer, doubter, maximalist, minimalist, technology, naturalism. But that's just the starting point. Then, as Pam emphasized, you need to look at the numbers. And most importantly, see whether the numbers that exist apply or are similar to you as an individual or not. Men much of the numbers we have in medicine are based on cherry-picked, narrow populations that don't reflect, reflect the real world of what family physicians and other uh, doctors, uh, the kinds of people they care for. And then stories. Now, you'll hear the term evidence-based medicine and scientific thinking. And stories are terrible. They're just anecdotes in terms of evidence-based medicine. But Daniel Gilbert, who's a professor of psychology at Harvard, published a paper in Science. And he asked the question, how can an individual best forecast or imagine the second part of the Bernoulli equation, the utility, the impact that something might have on your life if you've never had it. And he found and published in Science that it's very helpful to talk to people who have had that condition. Again, it sounds almost like common sense. Of course, you have to find someone who's similar to you in many ways, who has a similar sensibility or approach to life and so on. Now, anecdotes can be misleading. They can skew your thinking. On the other hand, they can be extremely valuable to you to at least give you a concrete sense of what life may be like in a certain medical condition. So we believe that when a person knows his or her medical mind, then you can communicate that using the terms that we found from our research to your doctor to explain how you weigh risk and benefit. And then the doctor can explain to you his or her mindset and how he or she weighs risk and benefit and together, hopefully, come to a decision that is best for you as an individual. Thank you. Um, so the question is, um, the, the uh, medical problem of uterine fibroids which are uncomfortable, and the recommendation is whether or not the patient should go to surgery for that type of problem. So I think this is an excellent example of a situation that falls into a gray, a gray area of medicine where there's not one right answer. So I think that um, the way you personally weigh risk and benefit for this problem will determine what course you take. 
And there are a number of options, surgery being the most aggressive, some sort of radiologic interventions being an intermediate, and then medication also an option. And depending on whether you're a maximalist and believer and would go running off to surgery, or a minimalist and doubter and don't want to do anything or take a very um, natural approach, for example, any of those can be correct for any particular individual. Excellent example. And you may change. Mm -hmm. So you may start, uh, you know, I, I like to say I'm a maximalist and a believer in recovery. <laughs> So the reason we're sitting is because I was having terrible back pain. I was a very avid athlete, and I rushed ahead and had surgery, which was a catastrophe. And um, so the, um, that tempered me a lot. So sometimes you may begin at a certain point and take a minimalist doubter point of view, but then the medical condition is such that the discomfort or the problems or whatever move you along the spectrum. You're saying that the experience of the family and the illnesses of the family uh, very powerfully shape maximalist, minimalist, believer, doubter. So, you know, we find there's new uh, gen technology where we can go to our genomes. Uh, you know. Well, the thing about the... Uh, right, so... Uh, right. Right. So, so the question is, um, you know, will we get answers from genetics and so on? And both of us have very strong backgrounds in basic science. It gives you probabilities. Okay, so for example, in the, in the research we did, we spoke with women who have what's called BRCA, which is a breast cancer risk gene where between 65 and 85 percent of women with this gene will develop breast cancer at some point in their life. Okay? So that's a number. It may occur in their 30s or it may occur in their 70s. And as you know, a gene is a static element. It's modified through the environment, through what's called epigenetics. So that the probability is the probability. For any one individual, you can't say you will get breast cancer at 40 or you will get breast cancer at 70. And I care for families which, which have this gene. And different women make different choices in terms of having a maximalist approach, which is to have both breasts removed proactively to prevent any risk of breast cancer versus women who might take a hormonal modifier or women who take a natural approach. And then they may change their minds. So we do not believe that the answer to medical decision making is going to come from, quote, big data or from genomics. It will give us more numbers. But those numbers are never absolute. And we interact with our environment in very complex ways. And we weigh risk and benefit based on that information. The question is, do the, are, do the mindsets change with age, and is it generational? Do you find more of one mindset at a certain age group, and then it change over time? So first, to answer the, the second question first, people definitely change. Um, I think you're very much impacted by the illnesses of your friends and family, um, and you can change very quickly, and your own experiences, too. And in the book, we describe, for example, a man who was a maximalist believer who was misdiagnosed and became a doubter and then contracted a very severe illness and had to have a bone marrow transplant, which is a, an extremely uncomfortable situation for a minimalist doubter. And he had to get past that and become a maximalist believer in order to have that uh, done and to survive it. So it, it's definitely a spectrum and you can move along that spectrum. 
Um, as far as the question of whether it's generational and there are more minimalists uh, among young people or, or older people, I would say there was not a consistent pattern that um, we found um, all mindsets in all age groups. Uh, the question was, um, can we speak to the impact of the internet um, on, on patients' medical thinking? And there, there is no way to underestimate the impact of the internet. It has really changed very much um, how patients um, receive information and make their decisions. And I think um, we talked about the concept of availability, of um, hearing stories. So it used to be that you would hear stories from your family, from your friends. Now you hear stories of everyone. All you have to do is go on the internet, and, and in a minute, you've got thousands of stories. So the, the impact in terms of stories is enormous from the internet. Also, it used to be that patients got most of their information from their doctor. They came in, they found out what they had, the doctor told them what the choices were, and that's where most of the information gathering occurred. Now, very rarely do we have somebody who comes in as kind of a blank slate, not knowing information already. By the time they come to see us, we're specialists. Um, and if they start not having information, very quickly they gather information by going on the internet. So it really has changed the dynamic in terms of information gathering, but I think in terms of decision making, the role of the doctor has even become more critical because the doctor is in the best position to help weight the information, to, to explain what's um, reliable and not reliable information on the internet. The question is how, how is, how are our ideas and the findings from the field research we do might influence medical education? I think several fold. The survey done in the United States, I don't know if they're comparable data in Canada from the University of Michigan, that in seeing a physician, either a, a family medicine physician, a primary care physician, an internist, or a specialist, in between 50 and 70% of cases, the doctor never asked the patient what he or she thought about the different options, but immediately gave the doctor's preference. Some of this is time pressure, but that we think it's very important to provide information, to think through the situation, but then to ask the person, what do you think? How do you see it? And so on. The second is to realize, as Pam emphasized, there is no one right answer. There's a tremendous movement now, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, in sort of a top-down kind of medicine, where an expert committee says, this is what it is, and this is what everyone should do, and it should be standardized. It's scientifically inaccurate. And it also takes away choice and advocacy from individuals. So that the terms, the language, language is very powerful. We hope that in medical education that by thinking about mindsets and thinking about different ways of weighing risk and benefit and how people are influenced in their choices will allow for truly shared decision making in a productive way rather than sort of a top-down imposition of a recommendation. I would just add to that that um, we have been invited to speak at numerous medical centers to the young residents, um, which ha have been very enthusiastic about the kinds of concepts here, which has been incredibly gratifying. Let me repeat the question, but not agree with you on everything, okay? <laughs> Dr. Klein may help in terms of what a, uh, the units for an elevated cholesterol in Canada would be of about 240. And the, it, it's, um, it, it's moderately elevated, and the cutoff is 200. So uh, the question was, uh, would Susan P uh, Powell, who was skeptical about statins and so on, think differently if she uh, had a family history which was terrible for heart disease, like I do? All the males in my family had a heart attack. I take a statin, okay? But she's not crazy or irrational. 
First of all, there are, there are a fraction of people, and when you go outside of clinical trials and you look at observational databases, like from Scripps in San Diego, and there's one from Wales, there are a lot of people who have more than many months to years of myopathy, actually availability. A colleague of ours, who's a psychiatrist on the faculty, took a statin and developed severe muscle pain, and his doctor was sure it couldn't be the statin, stopped it, it went away, so don't worry, he now is permanently disabled. Now that's a, a, an anecdote, but the answer is that there are people who have sustained muscle problem, plus there are people who have muscle diseases or predisposition, whether it be anything from fibromyalgia to polymyositis and so on. So the answer is yes. You know, you are very powerfully um, shaped by the experiences in your family. But think about it. If she's in Las Vegas and she's betting on a statin, she, you know, 199 people. You have to treat one person like Susan out of 300 to prevent a heart attack. 299 people take the medication with no clear benefit. So that's why it's really an individual decision. Can I put you on the spot? There are people in Canada who feel that we would be better off with a US-style medical system than our own uh, present universal Medicare. Can you comment? <coughs> with, with what you've talked about? Yeah. Well, we both feel very yes, strongly. The question. Uh, the question was, um, are we going to emigrate? <laughs> the question is, um, uh, how do we look at the Canadian system of healthcare versus the uh, system in the United States? So, both of us believe very strongly in in universal coverage in, in access. Um, both of us are very, very um, unhappy with the power of the insurance companies, private insurance companies, which now not only are doing ads like this and, and being sort of surrogate decision makers, um, but also are buying all the hospitals and the, ho and the doctor's practices so that they then will control. And regardless of what anyone tells you, an insurance company is an investment vehicle. That's what an insurer is. You know, that's what their, their raison d'etre is. It's to make money and then invest that in capital markets. That's capitalism. Um, so uh, in terms of um, those dimensions of the Canadian system, uh, I think they, um, uh, you know, universal coverage and so on. The, the thing in the States, and this is where um, I'm not a deep, deep expert, and your, Dr. Klein was educating me a bit about the provincial difference and pots of money given to different health ministers and so on. Um, it seemed, contrary to the impression in the States, that there's much more flexibility and freedom in terms of patient choice and physician advice than there is in the United States. So they're introducing something called pay for performance. Pay for performance pivots the doctor to no longer be the, to have the patient's interest as primary. Pay for performance means if Susan Powell does not take her statin medication, your salary goes down. Okay? This is how it works in England, by the way. They have pay for performance in Britain. You get a bonus if you force her to take her pill, and you get docked if she doesn't. So to us, this is the most pernicious aspect, and unfortunately, the president, who we had voted for, believes in this. It is a big tenant of, um, of what's called Obamacare. The thing is, the, the system will not change in the United States. The, the interests are too, are too powerful. So I hope that we can 
modify it and make it better over time with what we have. So the question is, um, do patients tend to choose doctors who have the same mindset as, as they do, and is it better if you do that? So at the beginning of our book, we profile three different patients with three different mindsets. They're all taken care of by the same doctor. They all love this doctor. And the doctor is able to negotiate and understand the patient's perspective and work with all three of these different mindsets successfully. So I think um, you certainly don't have to have a doctor with the same mindset. And as I said, sometimes it's better to be challenged and not go forward in a way that you have decided is correct without at least hearing the other point of view. Um, but sometimes um, patients are not satisfied with the point of view that they get from their doctor, and then they migrate on to somebody who might have a more uh, similar point of view. This is a very interesting question. Does mindset have um, an effect on outcome? Let's look at Susan Powell, okay? With all the genomics and all of the statistics, no one can say whether she will be that one in a hundred who will have the heart attack. And so if she doesn't take the pill, you might say as a minimalist and doubter, she made the mistake because she was the one who had the heart attack. On the other hand, remember, the statin medication reduces her risk by 30%. That means 70% of that 1% still get a heart attack. So she could be a believer and a match take the statin and still have the heart attack. So, to, you know, I think that in strictly uh, probabilistic terms, there's no way to ferret this out. What I do think it does, though, just from sort of a, I thought of the word um, like uh, what's called sechel in French, um, from the point of view of sort of wisdom and insight in my own situation, by being a doubter and a minimalist, it's very likely that over time, as miserable as it was, my back pain probably would have receded with very conservative measures. And the risk of the outcome of having a, a botched surgery or a poor outcome from a surgery is real. So the maximalist believer mindset can lead you in certain clinical conditions probably to a bad outcome. So the, the, this long-winded uh, answer means it's dependent on the condition and it's dependent on the likelihood of the outcome per se. I'll just add to that that we, we've been asked this before with regard to the placebo effect that whether or not believing helps you um, have a better outcome just because you believe in what it is. And we really haven't explored that, but we didn't find that optimism or pessimism particularly segregated out with any of these mindsets. Oh, so the, the question was, are we familiar with Patient Voices Network, which exists in British Columbia? And this woman says it's a, it's a program that helps people uh, be more, more uh, assertive, you said, and be able to explore options with their doctor. So I think exploring options with the doctor in a, a focused way is a, always a terrific um, approach. The question is, would a um, minimalist doubter patient with a naturalism orientation be more likely to go to a naturopath, for example? And uh, the answer to that is the, anyone with a naturalism orientation, whether that be a maximalist or a minimalist, would be the one who would be more likely to go to somebody who's a naturopath. So we have um, some relatives who are, have a strong naturalism orientation, one who's a minimalist and one who's maximalist. The maximalist, you open the cabinets and refrigerator, it's filled with thousands of supplements, and the minimalist has one, and if they have something wrong, they take that one supplement. <laughs> this is the world. The question is, um, illnesses that are, uh, 
often carry stigma, like mental illness, whether removing that stigma is important in terms of outcome. No illness should have a stigma. It's an illness. So um, uh, the sort of um, cultural, or, or which everyone has, I mean, this is, uh, you know, uh, in Toronto, Donald Redelmeyer, who's a, at the University of Toronto, has written about this way. He talks about his own emotions as being raised in an urban Canadian environment about, you know, you don't like an alcoholic because you think they abuse themselves and they're causing you a lot of work and they, you know, that kind of negative feeling impairs sober thinking and it's not subtle and the patient feels it. And so Redelmeyer, much to his credit, understands it and has worked it through and so on. So, so um, uh, there should be no stigma. I mean, I, I have done a lot of AIDS work since the beginning of the epidemic. And, you know, people who feel stigmatized or discriminated against for any reason, first, they won't access care. Then they don't feel they trust you in terms of what you're trying to recommend. And that sort of self-destructive... Uh, cycle leads to a bad outcome. Okay, so the question is, um, what further research are we doing and what are the next steps? So, we um, are working to um, uh, do research to more formally look at different groups of people in different parts of the United States at least. There's been tremendous interest in this. We've gotten emails from across the country in different uh, uh, disciplines and so on, obstetrics and, and, and a whole variety, to use this terminology uh, to first validate what we found in our field research, but also um, the level of interest in medical education, as was asked earlier, is tremendous. And so we hope that a curriculum can be developed in medical education so that physicians can learn and think and reflect on their own mindset and what shaped that mindset and then be much more sensitive and perceptive about the way their patients think uh, using this terminology. In terms of the policy implications, it's very interesting because work that was done in Canada, which we cite in the book from Ottawa and from other centers, there's an assumption made by policy experts that if you give a group of patients, understandable information, they will all choose what the expert thinks is best. <laughs> and so they've done this in Ottawa for hypertension and for the atrial fibrillation, the heart. The more people as a group understood the risks and benefits, and all of these numbers were made accessible, the greater the spectrum of choice and it went from maximalist to minimalist and so on. So that what we hope is that policymakers also understand, you know, when people don't want to take a medication, talk about stigma. Right now it's thought that, you know, they're either ignorant or irrational. But it, largely it's not. They just don't weigh the risk and benefit. They think, you know, feeling sluggish and having a headache is not worth five points on their blood pressure. And other people think they'll take twice as many pills to get that five points. So we hope that this shows that people are different, they're individuals, they can weigh things with being informed um, in a um, prudent way. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.